Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today, we take a deep dive into the potential and perils of artificial intelligence. In Hollywood, we get a behind the scenes look at how new technology could change the nature of actors' performances. And in the Big Apple, Microsoft's Vice President of Research and Innovation discusses how AI could transform medicine by improving patient care. But we begin with a major push to ensure big tech companies behave fairly. John Dickerson sits down with FTC Chair Lena Khan to learn more about her agency's ambitious efforts to protect Americans. In just four years, Lena Khan went from law student at Yale to leading 1,100 employees at the influential Federal Trade Commission. You and I are on the bus together, and I hear you work at the FTC. How do I know where the FTC affects me in my life? The FTC is on the front lines of protecting the American public from unlawful business practices. That includes protecting people from fraud or scams. It also means protecting people from monopoly power that can lead to higher prices, lower wages, less innovation. At 32, Khan became the youngest ever FTC chair, taking on trillion-dollar corporations. Five companies, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Google, Meta, Microsoft, represent big share of GDP, massive share of the growth in the S&P. Is that healthy? When you have open markets, you want them to be contestable, which means that the existing giants have to be susceptible to competition. Are they susceptible to competition? Well, look, there are a whole set of antitrust lawsuits underway right now that allege that these, some of these companies have engaged in anti-competitive tactics that have unfairly blocked competition. Khan accuses Amazon of tricking millions of people into paying for its $139 a year prime service, then making it hard to cancel. One of the lawsuits that we filed uh, alleged that Amazon had engaged in dark patterns and other types of deceptive what's design. A, what's a dark pattern? A dark pattern is a deceptive and manipulative design tactic that seeks to basically trick people into making decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make. Amazon says the FTC's claims are false on the facts and the law, and that by design, it made it clear and simple for customers to both sign up for or cancel their Prime membership, also pointing to high customer satisfaction. Packages are showing up right away. The prices are good. Why mess with that system? The goal is really to be ensuring that our markets are open, that if there is a new firm with a good idea, maybe even a better idea, that they're not being locked out of the market. At issue is whether to check companies before they get too big or after they have. Tech giants say not only are they not monopolies, but technological change means they'll always be open to competition. Federal judges handed the FTC high-profile defeats in cases against Microsoft and Meta. I have to ask, why are you losing so much? Thanks for the question, Congressman. Republicans um, at a recent House judiciary hearing were peppery. You're a bully. The Wall Street Journal editorial, which I know you've seen, looked at the Microsoft case, at the Meta case, and wrote this, a CEO with her record of failure would be out of a job. We've had significant success, and I'm very proud of the wins that we've had both in blocking mergers and in suing to prevent anti-competitive conduct. Conduct Khan says that can hurt not just companies' customers, but even their own workers. We also proposed a rule that would eliminate non-compete clauses in employment contracts. What kinds of people have non-compete clauses? It really runs the gamut from fast food workers and healthcare workers to engineers and journalists. And it means what? That I can't go get a better wage, get a better job. That's right. For example, one of the lawsuits that we brought was directed at non-competes that had been imposed on security guards. Uh, these are security guards making close to minimum wage, and the non-compete in their contract limited these security guards from going to get a job with a rival security guard company that was offering them better wages and better benefits. Busy enough already, Chair Khan also sees emerging threats possibly coming from artificial intelligence. We are seeing risks that AI could be used to turbocharge fraud and scams. We're also looking to be vigilant to ensure that we don't see 
anti-competitive practices or unfair methods of competition where some of the larger firms that have an advantage in this market are not using that power to squash competition. From Washington to the workplace, artificial intelligence has the potential to upend the day-to-day -day responsibilities of millions of employees. Nancy Chen explores the opportunities and threats of AI assistance in the office. Has AI changed the way you work? It has, and I find myself using it pretty much every day. Copywriter Guillermo Rubio credits artificial intelligence with significantly increasing his productivity. It just makes certain things go a bit faster, like research or uh, brainstorming ideas. Innovation also means change. A recent Goldman Sachs report found AI services could create jobs, but also expose as many as 300 million full-time positions to automation worldwide. Is this how grand and how dramatic of a shift that we're looking at here? It, it's, it's very powerful. AI is able to actually outperform us in, in, learn, in learning and adapting. So that we have not seen before in any technologies. Daniel Kuhn from Columbia Business School says the impact of AI will uniquely reach across industries. I think these more very physical and uh, labor intensive jobs won't be replaced. But I think thinking, analytical, uh, creative skill, these things are actually most exposed to uh, AIs at the moment. But there are also opportunities. We know ChatGPT came on the scene in November um, and it's been like wildfire ever since. How so? We've seen a massive uptick in posts on our platform. Margaret Lilani is a vice president at the job search site Upwork. It is not an or between chat GPT and humans. It's an and. Something Rubio has embraced. It's kind of a situation of adapt in order to survive. Yeah, survive and, and, and even thrive, I would say. Thriving in a new age of technology. Coming up. Would you get a manicure from a robot? How AI is transforming the beauty industry? This is Eye on America. Artificial intelligence could revolutionize every sector of the economy, and that includes the beauty and cosmetics industry. Anna Werner takes a look at the future of AI salon services. Customers seeking professional manicures have been heading to nail salons for more than a century. But in San Francisco, you can now stop by the lobby of this office building and have a robot do it. It's the brainchild of startup Clockwork. Co-founder and CEO Renuka Apte says the idea grew partly out of her own frustration with salon appointments. It hit this pain point that people immediately resonated with. It takes a long time to get your nails done. Correct, or beauty services in general. Clockwork's goal is to place these machines where people live and work, making a manicure super convenient and quick, just 10 minutes. So we really want this to be like grabbing a cup of coffee. And that could be anywhere from like apartment complexes to corporate offices, retail stores. We watched as the robot painted my nails with a single perfect blue coat. With just a minor hiccup, we have a little hole in this one, requiring a redo of my thumb. Artificial intelligence, AI, is what enables this robot to scan nails individually and paint each accurately. Cecile Quiambo took a break from work to try it. What do you think? I love them. I can never paint them this smooth, looking so nice on my own. Never. I see myself coming back here often. But if another company is successful, you might not have to leave home. Nimble Beauty has sold more than 5,000 of its home devices on Kickstarter and has begun shipping them to early buyers. CEO Omri Moran. You can do it at any time of the day while getting great results. Its four coat manicure takes about an hour. My Express manicure, two coats in about 25 minutes, wasn't quite as precise as the clockwork manicure, but the company says the machine learns over time using AI. What would happen if you tried to have a nail painting robot that didn't have AI? I don't think you can do it without AI. Because without the AI, you'd basically have a robot that would sort of do like one thing. Yes, it would be able to identify the specific nails that it has saved in the system versus understanding what a nail is and then figuring out, oh, I'm seeing a nail. This is the shape of this nail. 
This is the cuticle. That is where the AI comes into play. But to see what artificial intelligence in the beauty space can really do, take a look at this. You're watching robot arms ever so gently pick their way through this woman's eyelashes to add eyelash extensions. It's a process that typically takes a human over two hours of precise, painstaking labor. That's why Loom co-founder Nate Harding decided it was a great job for a robot. Yeah, it's perfect. Because, because why? Because it's so laborious and it's right on the edge of human ability. Like I like robotics applications where you're augmenting what a human can do, not really replacing them. Coming up with a machine that could perform such a delicate task took six years. Safety is critical. So Harding says the robot arms that select individual lashes, then glue on the extensions, are literally light as a feather. We mounted them with little tiny magnets that are so weak, watch, I can just flip it off with my finger like so that. it comes it's, right off. It right? comes right off. Lisa Sansonong came to Oakland all the way from Kansas for this. Here she is before and after. It feels great and it looks, I, lo I love it. But will this take lash artists' jobs? Their national association told us it doesn't think so. While it acknowledged some lash artists have expressed fear of losing their jobs, it said the robots could attract a whole new clientele for lash extensions. So what about nail technicians? How do you respond to some people in the industry who may say, well, okay, but you're going to put people out of work? Uh, I don't think we're going to put nail salon techs out of work. And the reason is that this isn't, uh, that's like saying like a vending machine would put a chef out of work, right? It's like saying that. What we're going for is express services, get in, get out. There's just a whole gamut of things that humans can do. And this is not that. Her company is putting out two to three more machines in new locations each month. And Loom just installed a machine in a retail outlet, Ulta Beauty, in San Jose, California. From the beauty salon to the big screen, productions are beginning to utilize this groundbreaking technology to create performances from actors' previously captured images. Jonathan Vigliotti heads to Hollywood to witness the dawn and dilemmas of AI acting. At the age of 80, Harrison Ford is starring as Indiana Jones, both old and young. Audiences could soon see a new performance by James Dean, who died in 1955. And an upcoming film will feature Tom Hanks and Robin Wright as they appeared in Forrest Gump nearly 30 years ago. I'm going to show you some magic. This man became famous as a young Tom Cruise, a makeover from the AI company Metaphysic. You know, I do all my own stunts, obviously. It is now immortalizing actors through image capture like this to appear in future films without ever being on set. CEO Tom Graham. There is a move now from many people to preserve their likeness that in the future could be used to create their performance. This is going to be a core asset for every performer. You know, I could be hit by a bus tomorrow and that's it, but my performances can go on and on and on and on and on. But how that likeness is preserved, who has access to it, and who cashes in on it are key concerns of SAG-AFTRA, the union that represents actors. We're not anti-AI. It is okay for performers, likeness, image voice to be digitally modeled and captured, provided they know exactly what it's going to be used for and see that there are appropriate safeguards in place to make sure that that data is not made available beyond its intended use. Safeguards that currently don't exist. We need to focus heavily on the ethics and how we deploy AI. And so we need to really work hard to move our institutions very, very quickly to be able to accommodate some of these new potential outcomes. You ain't nothing. Ahead, could AI replace your doctor? That story's next. We close our show with a look inside Microsoft's Technology Center, where researchers are developing AI programs to improve the healthcare industry. Dr. John LaPook speaks with Microsoft VP of Research and Innovation, Peter Lee, about the next generation of patient care. Initiating the holographic emitter array. 
There was a time when holographic doctors Please state the nature of the medical emergency. were purely the stuff of science fiction. In 2017, I met with actor Bob Picardo, who played the emergency medical hologram in Star Trek, to talk about how medicine might one day meet science fiction. Do you think that eventually in the future, a computer algorithm could entirely replace a physician? That artificial intelligence physician will be created from the personal experiences of a large group of doctors. So yes, I believe the day will come when you will be obsolete. Lieutenant, I'll take care of this. Picardo's prediction seemed far-fetched. But how about now, in this age of AI? I asked Peter Lee, Microsoft's Vice President of Research and Incubations. OpenAI has said that ChatGPT4 has scored something like in the 90th percentile on the, the bar. Should we be concerned in healthcare that these computers are going to replace us in some way? Absolutely not. Um, and by the way, uh, GPT-4 also gets about 90% on the U.S. medical licensing exam. But can it hold a hand? That's the key. This is a new type of tool. It's not a human being, but it's not a computer like we're used to. Lee considers artificial intelligence to be a powerful tool that could dramatically improve patient care and cut down on one of the biggest complaints in healthcare, paperwork. A primary care physician will spend about 40 to 45 percent of their working day writing clinical encounter notes and filling out prior authorization forms. The hope is that it will allow doctors and nurses to again make eye contact and be present with their patients. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. But judging by its portrayal in movies and TV, AI has some convincing to do. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. Is it developing some sort of a machine consciousness? Uh, they don't have a consciousness, but um, they are learning from all of us. I wondered if AI had already learned what a human practitioner has to do all the time, figure out what's important and what's not. How old would you like to be for today's visit? Oh, so let's say I'm 50 years old, mildly elevated blood sugar. Okay. I have a bellyache. It comes and goes. Physician assistant Andrea Barrett Thank demoed so for us the DAX Express, Microsoft's artificial intelligence technology designed to capture and summarize a patient encounter. My toes are, are numb every now and then. Yeah, I, I've had that for years. All right. Is one leg worse than the other? Are they about yeah, the same? Yeah, both. Ever since I was in Australia and I was in a whitewater rafting accident and I ended up tearing my my ACL in my knee when I hit a rock that was submerged. Oh, okay, did you have it replaced? No, no, okay. the rock stayed the same. <laughs> it was really hard to get it out of the stream. As it turned out, it did recognize that my knee injury had nothing to do with my bellyache and placed that piece of information in a separate part of the summary. As you see, it, it did take out that joke that you said about the rock. So it figured out that when I bashed my knee whitewater rafting in Australia, it had nothing to do with the abdominal pain. Correct. That's impressive that it was able to filter out a lot of the sort of extraneous banter back and forth. Yep. As the clinician, you can decide if you want that included. But there are also concerns about what the technology might leave in. There's an expression that AI machines can hallucinate. <laughs> what does that mean? What does it refer to? So it refers to the possibility that the AI system might provide answers uh, that aren't completely correct. Lee says scientists are working on the equivalent of a lie detector for machines based on finding unusual patterns of computer signals. Sometimes they're defensive, these computers, <laughs> right? They say they just double down on the mistake. Once the thing thinks a certain line of reasoning is the right one, it can get stuck in that line of reasoning. Wait, computers can be stubborn? They can remind us as human beings of some of our own foibles, uh, but these are just machines. They're just tools. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thanks for watching Eye on America.